All right, thank you very much, everyone. Um, I want to uh, thank you for coming today. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, some COVID numbers, and I have a few announcements and other things, so we'll, we'll get through this. Um, the state's numbers as of yesterday, uh, 2,495 new confirmed cases in Massachusetts, bringing the total confirmed cases in Massachusetts to 172,471. There were 37 deaths reported yesterday in the Commonwealth, and um, 9,900 and 94 people have passed away in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts due to COVID-19. In Boston, as of today, 355 new confirmed cases. That's a total of 23,196. There's no new deaths, uh, bringing our total to 884 deaths. Um, our prayers are, are with the families who are sick and suffering with COVID-19 and, and those families who have lost loved ones. I'm going to address a little bit in a few minutes about the number of cases today. Today is the largest case number I think we've seen since maybe June in the city of Boston, 355 cases. Uh, for the testing data for the week ending November 6th, Friday, November 6th, the average of uh, 2,500 2500 Bostonians got tested each day. That was a really big increase compared to the 1780 from the week before. The Get the Test Boston campaign is having an impact, and I want to thank all the folks who are getting tested. I also want to thank the, the media who helped us promote uh, getting tested uh, a couple weeks ago. It, it's really it's been, been beneficial. It means that we're going to be able to respond more accurately and effectively to where the virus is spreading and certainly how it is spreading. At the same time, we also saw more positive cases here. Our daily new cases went up to 180, and last week we're at 128 cases per day. So we're seeing a pretty significant increase in daily cases. The results of our positive test rate remained at 7.2%, the same as the previous seven days. So the, the positive rate will stay the same because we're doing more testing, but we're looking at the number of new cases per day. The neighborhoods with the highest positive rates in the city remain Dorchester, Mattapan, and East Boston. Roxbury and Rosendale also went up over 10% last week. And East Boston is, is still a major concern now. The rate has jumped to over 16% of the people testing positive in East Boston are testing positive for COVID-19. We still have a lot of work to do, and we're focused on getting the most comprehensive data so we can see a full picture. The epidemic is evolving, and its impact on our neighborhoods also evolve. We need to evolve, and what we're doing is monitoring so we understand and understand the complexities of the COVID-19 spread in our communities. For the last few weeks, our public health experts have been digging deep into the data, and they'll be developing additional metrics, uh, which we'll be able to share more about next week. And we're looking at the metrics so we can get somewhat of a, 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 a I guess, a more accurate number for a Boston, what a Boston rate would look like. But that's going to be with increased testing and, and other, other ways of looking at it, including hospitalization. Uh, in the meantime, you can help strengthen our data and protect your family by getting tested. We have over 30 testing sites here in the city, and we have two operate, we're operating two mobile testing sites that are free and open to anyone regardless of symptoms. This week through Saturday, they're in East Boston at Central Square Park, and they're in Mattapan at Jubilee Christian Church on Blue Hill Avenue. And just to call ahead, we're asking people to call ahead to pre-register. Those numbers and information about all of our testing sites, you can either go to the website at boston.gov slash coronavirus, or just simply by calling 311 here at City Hall. Um, we saw gatherings last week and over the weekend in here in the city. Uh, they were peaceful and positive uh, demonstrations and celebrations right here at City Hall Plaza. We had one. The vast majority of people were wearing masks. We just wanted to monitor the crowd to make sure everyone was having masks on. I want to thank all the people. I want to thank the police department, first responders, for ensuring that everyone had a safe experience. Uh, but we also want to just remind people, if you're gathering groups like you did over the weekend and, and uh, last week after the election, we're asking you should probably get tested. It'll probably be helpful to you and your family just to get a test, just to make sure that you're okay. And please, every day, whatever you're doing, we want people to continue to be vigilant, be safe, and help us stop the spread of the virus. We are at another critical point. Last time I said something like that was probably back in May, but we're at a critical point right now here in Boston and Massachusetts. We need to continue to work together. We're asking people to wear face coverings while they're outside their home. We're asking you to eat regardless of anyone around you or not. We're asking you to wear a face mask outside your home. We're asking people to continue to remind them to wash their hands with soap and warm water and continue to wipe down surfaces that are often frequently touched. We're asking people to avoid gatherings, especially parties. We're asking you don't host gatherings and don't attend gatherings. That's something that we're seeing. I was talking to a buddy of mine today, and he was telling me that uh, 
there was a gathering somewhere, a bunch of people were there, and six of the five or six of the people that were there got COVID-19. So it's it really is it spreads it, and, and you would think it's innocent, but it might appear innocent. But if they're not family members, you don't know who other people are in contact with. So you want to keep yourself safe, and you want to obviously keep your family safe. If you are, if you, um, we also were, the new state advisory went into place. We're asking people to stay home between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. Unless you have to go to work or run uh, for essential items, errands for essential items. If you operate a business, we're asking you to follow the safety guidelines and the new closing time of 9.30 for in-person dining and other activities. And I know there's some pushback on that, and businesses are upset about the, the 10 o'clock closing. Uh, but again, when you have 300 plus cases in one day in Boston, and we haven't seen those numbers since the beginning of the virus when everything was shut down, we don't want to go back to that place. So we're asking people to please uh, pay attention to, to the suggested recommendations. For any information people are looking for on reopening or on the virus right now, you go to boston.gov slash reopening. Or again, you can call 311. Uh, the MBTA, uh, we're working hard right now in the city to do everything we can to turn this trend around, uh, to keep our city safe, and to build back our economy in a way that's healthy and strong and equitable for all. We've seen it since the beginning that transportation is essential to each of those goals. In the city, we took the opportunity to expand our healthy and equitable travel options, investing in new bike lanes and bus lanes. So I have a comment on the cutbacks to the MBTA service that were proposed last week. This is not the right way to move forward, not for our immediate needs and not for our long-term recovery. These cuts undermine our COVID responses to be able to have physical distancing on trains and buses, it hurts the essential and frontline worker who have the fewest transportation options. It reduces disability access. It delays our climate change goals. And they hamstring our ability to get people to jobs and to uh, recover, get a quick recovery in our economy. I certainly understand, as good as anybody, as well as anybody, that there are budget gaps. Every level of government is facing budget gaps right now, from local cities and towns to the state to the federal government. But we have to dig deep. We have to protect our future. The responsibility is to find the revenue, not to make cuts that could, could damage our recovery. This will only hurt our revenue in the long run. I'm going to be advocating from now until the vote takes place to protect the health, the equity, and the future of Boston and the greater Boston communities. So I want to just be very clear on that. I have some school updates. Health and e equity have been at the priorities of our school reopening. As of today, the Boston Public Schools remain fully remote. Last Friday, the state re released new guidelines on schools, and the Boston Public Schools is reviewing this, this, this gu these guidelines. We're going to continue to take a very cautious approach, prioritize the safety of all of our students, families, teachers, and staff in all of our school communities, and we will prioritize the well-being of our highest-need students. To be clear, these are children and young people who need the services they get in school to, to be fully healthy and safe. And that's why we are focused on getting them back to school as soon as possible. Boston Public Schools and the superintendent have been working on this hard. They've been in continual communication with our families and special needs communities. They've been working, in, they've been in continuous talks with the teachers, and I know that the vast majority of our teachers want to be back in the classrooms with their students. We are ready to support safe, in-person learning when, that serves students with very complex disabilities. The schools that we're talking about, that have, having this education happening in, is the Horace Mann, the Carter, the McKinley Schools, and the Henderson. BPS, the Boston Public Schools, have taken extra steps to address health and safety concerns, including purchasing freestanding air filter units for all of these schools. And we are hopeful that we can move forward with plans starting this coming Monday. Health, health experts have been clear that getting students with deep needs back into school must become a priority. These are, these are, these are folks who are specialists we're hearing around the country. Our special needs parents are very clear on this as well. So we will work with our public health experts and our families and our teachers to make sure this plan is done safely and this plan is done right for our students. As you can see today, I'm joined by members of the Police Reform Task uh, Force. The, the Police Reform Task Force, yes, I got it right the first time, uh, with me today. Just before coming down, we took an important step forward and I'm going to, that I'm going to share with you today. Our goal is to sustain the urgency of the moment to achieve deep and meaningful change here in Boston to create a national model for breaking down systemic racism collaboratively with, with, with the community in ways that improve public safety for all. 
The task force is a group of leaders and advocates who have worked hard on these issues for years on their own. They've also acted as a vehicle for Boston's black communities to lead this change. Through their role as leaders in our community, through their community process with five listening sessions and listening to hundreds and hundreds of voices, two rounds of feedbacks for the recommendations, and through their continued conversations and advocacy here today. So I take these recommendations very seriously, not only as the work of leaders and experts, but as a collective expression of residents across the black and brown communities as they're calling for lasting systemic change. 30 days ago, when we announced the final recommendations, I pledged to act on each and every one of them and to do so in a timeline that the task force laid out. And that's what we've done. We began by filing a home rule petition to give Boston High School graduates a preference in police hiring. That will increase diversity and have more officers drawn from the communities that they're serving. There's a hearing scheduled for December 3rd, and I hope that the council is in the city council, and I hope the council will act quickly on this so that we can advocate together for this petition before the state legislature in the start of the new session in January. I directed our chief of equity and other city leaders to work with the police department on updating their policies through the equity lens, as well as create a diversity and inclusion unit in the Boston Police Department. This conversation is moving forward. We created a job description for the executive director of the proposed Office of Public Police Accountability and Transparency. That way, we can have somebody ready to lead this new system forward as soon as it's approved by the council. That job will be posted on Monday for any interested Boston residents to apply for. Today, we are taking more key steps to enact this community vision change. This afternoon, I signed two executive orders. The first one creates a civilian review, review board. It's made up of nine community members nominated by both the mayor's office and the city council. They'll be empowered to review complaints and rec recommend actions, review police policies, and provide public input, publish reports on the BPD's progress and other functions. The second order is to take what was our co-op board and turn it into a stronger internal affairs oversight panel. That panel will have the power to review all, com all completed internal affairs cases. The co-op board, up until I signed this, had the opportunity to review 20, 20 percent of the cases. This panel will review, have the opportunity to review all cases. In addition to cases, it will be able to review the policies and procedures of internal affairs and engage with the community about their impacts. In addition to those executive orders, we have drafted an ordinance that I will file with the City Council next week. This is an ordinance which create the Office of Police Accountability and Transparency, or OPAT. The OPAT provides intake services, research and administrative supports to the Civilian Review Board and the Internal Affairs Oversight Panel. The OPAT Commission will have full subpoena power to investigate misconduct. This structure creates a single point of public access to a no, new gold standard of police accountability and community oversight. It also provides a more predictable and predictability and a structure for our police officers. This is what our communities speaking through the task force have called for. And this is what we are implementing here in the city. I'm excited to move forward with this work with the city council on achieving this historic change for our city. I want to thank the members of the task force, Chairman Wayne Budd, who could not be with us here today. And I want to thank the members of the subcommittee. I'm going to mention everyone behind me, but there's members of the subcommittee that helped create the Office of Police Accountability and Transparency. Joseph Feaster, Allison Cartwright, Jamal Crawford, Tanisha Sullivan. I also want to thank Reverend Jeffrey Brown and Re Darren Howell, who's with us today, for their great work. I'd like to now just turn the mic over to Tanisha Sullivan to say a few words. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Again, I'm Tanisha Sullivan, president of the NAACP Boston branch. I'd like to begin by thanking uh, my fellow task force members, those who are here with us today, as well as those who are unable to be with us. I'd also like to thank uh, the elected officials and countless community members who provided us with critical, necessary input um, as we were developing the recommendations that were submitted and submitted to and adopted by uh, the mayor. Especially I want to thank uh, Mayor Walsh for not only receiving and adopting these recommendations, but for respecting the integrity of the recommendations with an understanding that they were informed by 
Boston residents, as well as the best practices and structures that have been implemented across the country. While these are not the only solutions needed, the ones that were articulated by the mayor, they truly do speak to what is possible when we lean into the challenge determined to make change. I want to remind us that the task force was uh, charged with providing policy recommendations in four areas. The use of force policies, the expansion of the body-worn camera, program, the diversity and inclusion, diversity, equity and inclusion unit which speaks to the internal culture of the BPD and of course uh, the oversight and accountability aspect of this work which brings us to the Office of Police Accountability and Transparency. Um, I do want to say that these recommendations uh, certainly serve as what we would describe as a foundation for this work, um, and it is our hope and certainly our expectation that we will continue to build on this work. But the recommendations alone are not enough. They are simply words on paper unless and until they are implemented. So we are certainly pleased uh, to be here today as the mayor took the crit a critical step forward in signing the two executive orders, uh, establishing the Civilian Review, Review Board, and also uh, expanding the authority and power of the Internal Affairs Oversight Panel, as well as finally uh, moving toward uh, filing the OPAT ordinance. But I want to be clear that while the mayor has done his part in using his executive authority, his executive pen, we collectively are responsible for making this change and ensuring that it is seen through to the end. So as each component of the recommendations moves through the implementation process, we fully expect that the city and the BPD and the Office of Equity will continue to engage with community to ensure that we are increasing racial justice across our public safety departments. Again, I want to thank my fellow task force members and the hundreds of community members that made this work possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nisha. And I also want to uh, introduce, uh, mention De Dennis White from uh, Chief of Staff of the Boston Police Department that also served on the task force that's with us today. If you could bear with me for one second, let me get my place here. Um, before I end, just want a couple more things. Yesterday was Veterans Day, as we all know. Uh, we talk a lot about democracy these days. Our belief is that democracy um, and the work that we have to do to protect this democracy. Let's never forget who makes our democracy possible. It's our veterans. Yesterday, we dedicated a Hero Square in Brighton to the memory of Lieutenant Thomas Redgate. He was reported missing in action in, in, in the Korean War over 70 years ago. His remains were found this April, and it means the world to his family to see his service and his sacrifice honored in our community. I also participated yesterday in a telethon for home base. It highlights the invisible wounds of war impacting our veterans and military families and connects veterans to care. We reached out to our veteran community. Usually we have a big push around Veterans Day, Operation Thank a Vet, where we get a chance to go to people's homes, knock on the doors, and, and offer them whatever we offer here in the city of Boston and thank them for their service. We visited yet veterans yesterday in the home. We thanked them for their service and we connect them to, to programming. This year, due to COVID, we called veterans on the phone to say thank you and provide wellness checks. So I had a great chance yesterday to talk to a bunch of veterans on the phone, some World War Two. One guy was 95, 95 years old. He told me he's 95 years old. He watches me on the news every day, told me I'm doing a pretty good job, and I was happy. Uh, and I just want to thank all the veterans that I spoke to yesterday on the phone. Um, it's really important that we thank them. There are close to 20,000 veterans living in the city of Boston, nearly 3% of our population. They are diverse in age, race, and gender. They enrich everyone, every, all of our neighborhoods as leaders and mentors. I want to thank them and the veterans for the, who work um, in the city of Boston. I want to thank our own Veterans Service Commissioner, Rob Santiago, who does some amazing work here. 
I want to thank all of our veterans and their families who live in the city of Boston. And to the families that are watching, to the veterans watching uh, this press conference, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Uh, and to the families of veterans who serve this country, I want to thank you as well. And to all the Gold Star families, I want you to know that you're in our thoughts and prayers. With that, I will open up for questions. It's all right. It's all right, Charmin. I think when, when the numbers get safe, we will open in-person learning uh, and we will begin, a, we'll, we will resume our phased in approach. Uh, obviously the first students come back will be the highest needs. We are trying to get uh, some, some uh, high needs students in school next week in a small number of kids, not a lot. Uh, but when we feel it's safe, right now in Boston, I just don't, I don't feel safe and comfortable opening the schools in Boston. I'm not sure what Carlisle's rate is. It might be a little less than ours. There are parts of the state that, that aren't experiencing what we're experiencing here. So we're going we're gonna to monitor the situation on a daily basis. I had a conversation with um, Commissioner Riley the other day to talk about this in Boston. I said, you know, we have 54,000 kids in our, in our schools. We have 225 different school buildings. We have, um, you know, transportation needs, and we're busing kids from different neighborhoods. And right now, it just doesn't make sense. I also had a conversation with some charters and parochials last week as well about the same thing. You know, Boston's, in some cases, might have a little different complexities in other places. Kids go from one neighborhood to another neighborhood. We have lots of immigrant families. We have, you know, our rate in the Latino community is pretty high. Um, the Latino community is very high. I think it's 30, I think it's about 37, 38 percent of our Boston students in school. So right now it wouldn't be the right time for us to do in person in Boston. I'd love to get our kids back in school. That's our goal. That's our priority. We want, I want them in as soon as possible. But right now, today, isn't the right move for Boston. Hey, gatherings following the election results have led to any virus spreading? Not yet. I mean, it's still a couple days later, so, you know, usually that'll happen five to seven days afterwards, so we haven't really seen that. Um, I don't think we've seen much even back in May and June when there was lot, lots of um, demonstrations and rallies and, and marches, and, and we didn't see a lot of spread there either. Um, I'm not a doctor or a scientist. It just seems different right now. It seems like more people are catching the virus, and I don't know if there's a different strand of the virus. I don't know if Marty has anything to say about that, but, um, you know, it just seems like it, more, more and more people. I, I made this comment today. For the months of July, August, September, um, and October, quite honestly, I didn't know personally anyone that got the virus that, that I remember. In the last five days, I know seven or eight people that got the virus. So it's kind of, it seems different. You know, right now I'm 100% focused on the challenges here in the city. Um, you know, we're seeing uh, with the COVID administration, COVID, COVID administration, COVID going up. I'm focused on that. Uh, I mean, I'm honored uh, to, to be to be to be mentioned. Uh, but you know, I love my job as mayor, and I'm looking forward to uh, the next several years uh, working with an administration in Washington that believes in science, that it uh, believes in immigration rights, that believes in infrastructure that believes in housing, that believes in climate change. Um, that's going to that's gonna be a real big difference. And uh, I was on a call over the weekend with the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Um, well, it actually wasn't U.S. Conference, it was Democratic Mayors. And we talked about just the, the, the ability to be able to move uh, so many different issues forward. Uh, and that's what I'm looking forward to right now. So you're not looking and that's what I'm, I'm looking forward to that right now. Has the Biden transition team been in contact with you about potential posts no. in his administration? No. no. Um, well, there's, there's a couple steps here. I think uh, the governor would have an appointment, um, and then um, so he'd appoint somebody for 90 days, and then uh, there'd be a race for it. So again, I mean, I'm, I'm focused right now on uh, we, we just spent you know two years in this country uh, and, and, a, and a, what, I, what I would call a grueling campaign uh, to change the direction of this country, and I'm gonna I'm gonna savor this and enjoy this for a little bit before I start thinking about the next election. Um, so whatever that next election is, we'll, we'll be able to work on. On COVID, uh, the state is approaching a pretty grim milestone, um, 10,000 deaths. It could, it could reach that today. Um, what's your reaction to that? I mean, it's it's um, 
when I look at the numbers, when I compare Massachusetts to other states or Boston to other cities, um, I think back to the early days of COVID, we were, we were number three or four consistently for a long period of time where we had the highest rate of COVID cases and the highest rate of deaths. Uh, June, July came and we, we went to the middle of the pack. What my concern is, is that if, if we don't get this under control, that number is going to grow even higher. Um, you know, it, it, it goes back to, I mean, it goes back to Washington. I mean, 240,000 people in Americans have lost their life due to COVID-19 with zero direction from the White House and still no direction. The President of the United States hasn't shown his face in the last five days. And, and yesterday was the single largest day for COVID cases in the United States of America and the single largest day for deaths of Americans in America. And the White House is not responding to that. So that shows you a, a lack of leadership that, that, that has hurt us here in this country. So I'm hopeful that we can do our efforts here, the governor's efforts with the, with the curfew and with the masks and what he's doing and our efforts here in the city and other mayors across our state. Uh, we do what we need to do to get the, get the numbers down. Right. Don't Sean will be asking me questions about governor in a few minutes. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I guess just last week the governor talked about guidelines to try to prevent any kind of shutdown. Uh, and with these numbers rising so badly, do you see that that might have to happen in Boston again? Well, the governor announced it last week, so we're not seeing the benefit of that yet. Uh, again, it, usually what happens, somebody comes down with COVID-19 and, and uh, the hospitalization or, and, uh, follows five or six days later. So, you know, I'm going to really track in these numbers for the next 10 days really closely to see if the uh, curfew and the order to wear a mask has made an impact. People listen. I mean, w when, we, when I asked the Boston residents to get tested, they responded in a big way. Uh, we've averaged 2,500 tests per day uh, for the last for several days, so that that's a good thing. Uh, I, I just hope that you know l people. We got to we have to let our neighbors and friends know too. Wearing masks are important. Washing hands are important. All of those things are vitally important. We need to stop the spread of the virus. Uh, what we're seeing in uh, Tennessee and other parts of the country, uh, and other parts of the world, quite honestly, uh, we cannot afford to have that in Boston. If we do, then we're going to be shutting everything down again. And I think that the second, the second shutdown here, the first one was bad on business. I think the second one will be, will be far, more, far worse. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Joe.